Welcome to the Game or Die podcast, episode 15. So, I've got some stuff I want to talk about, but before I get into anything, I just want to kind of talk about um, my dog, Raz. He passed away last week, and Raz was a really special dog, and I mean that in every sense of the word. Raz was my first dog that I owned. Um, Sunny, our other pit bull, she uh, was my wife's before we got married, so she wasn't mine, and I never had a dog growing up. Uh, my parents had dogs, you know, um, after I started kind of getting out of the house, you know, um, living on my own and things like that. My sister has a dog, but I never had a dog of my own. So Raz was kind of my first one, and uh, we got married, or my wife and I, when we got married, she wanted another dog, and she wanted a, she shows pit bulls um, for confirmation training and stuff like that. So she wanted another dog, and uh, a little over two years ago, back in uh, August of 2017, uh, we got a do- uh, pit bull, and he was a brindle color, and I've never even heard of that color of a dog before. And brindle's very dark brown uh, with, like, lighter brown slash amber patches and stuff like that, uh, and black stripes and stuff, kind of like, almost like tiger striping in a way. And so when we got him, he was a little baby puppy. He was, I think, uh, eight, eight weeks old, something like that. And uh, we were trying to figure out if a, a name for this dog. And one of the things that my wife and I really connected with was uh, the video game Psychonauts. It's my favorite game of all time. You've heard me talk about it before on other podcasts. And when we were dating, she was like, oh, well, what's your favorite game, video game? And I was like, oh, Psychonauts. And I told her all about it, and she sounded super interested. And so she played it on her own. She loved it. And so when we uh, got our dog after we got married, it was like, oh, well, what should we name it? And we were like, oh, let's name it after Psychonauts. And so the main character in Psychonauts is Rasputin. And uh, they they call him Raz, R-A-Z for short. And so we got Raz. We named him Raz because of Psychonauts. And he was energetic, man. That, That dog, he just would not stop loving you and um super adorable very tall and lanky um he was a little bit more than i expected when when we first got him too i was just like wow this is a lot of dog in a very small package and as he grew he got really (laughs) tall and lanky and long and just oh boy that dog he had um he had energy for days and days and days. And so we would have him, you know, out for a while. Um, we had him in like a like a kid's playpen almost area downstairs for a long time uh, whenever we would be down there and stuff like that because he would just run all over the place. And, you know, we had like an open floor design with a kitchen and stuff like that. And I tried cooking. It was really hard to cook with him or out, out and about. And so we had him in this little play area. And it wasn't even little. It was pretty big. But he was just a big dog. So uh, we had him for a while. And around seven months after uh, we had him, he started, he had this, uh, he, we were both in our room and he started yelping. And he had this, uh, he had a, a seizure apparently, and I've never seen a dog go through a seizure before, and it was terrifying. So um, we called the vet, you know, they walked us through what was going on, 
said, hey, this is what a seizure is and this is what it looks like. And we had no idea. So he has started developing a lot of um, health issues and things like that. And I'm honestly not even really sure exactly what ha- uh, happened, what he had, but it just became more and more frequent over the years. And um, with with his uh, quality of life, it was just, it was really hard on him. You know, you could see how much he just loved being out and about and hanging out and having fun. And so uh, we made the decision to um, to basically, um, oh man, this is hard. He uh, passed away on Friday, last Friday. And he, it was really hard because he had a seizure that morning. And it was just like, man, this sucks. This poor dog is going through these seizures on almost a weekly basis. And a couple weeks before that, he actually had two in one day. And it was just like it was affecting him uh, mentally and things like that. And it was just, it was really hard to see him go through that. So last Friday, uh, my wife and I, we gave him the perfect day. We hung out with him. I spent all the time after, after he had a seizure, I put him outside for a little bit so that he can, you know, uh, go run around, uh, go potty and stuff like that. And then I, we spent the entire day with him. We took him in the car. We took him to the post office, brought him back. We walked him a little bit. Um, my wife walked him uh, out in the back, you know, in the woods. And we just spent the day loving him. <sighs> and he was, he was a wonderful, wonderful dog. Very big, very slobbery, very high energy. But he was super fun to hang out with. He just loved cuddling. One of my favorite memories that we ever ha- uh, had with him was this last Valentine's Day, actually. My wife and I went to a dog show in Arizona. And in Arizona, uh, it was the same dog shows that um, my wife does. Uh, and I've been to a couple of them. I don't really go all that often. Mainly because I'm just exhausted and tired and I don't want to deal with uh, being around a ton of people and dogs and oh my gosh. But we did this like little road trip for a couple days and we took both of our dogs, Sunny and Raz, and I got to bond with them a lot. You know, just being out in the sun in a park setting, uh, taking them in and out, uh, doing the uh, dog show stuff, which I actually got to do, which was really fun. It was. Very interesting to be on the other side of that in the ring um, where the judge says, all right, uh, go run your dog around um, so that they can watch like the gate and the movement. And basically, I had no idea. And, and I watched Best in Show a couple of years ago and I kind of understood, hey, this is what a dog show is. It's not these weirdo people, you know prancing around with their dogs, although some of it actually is, but <laughs> um, for me, it's, it's understanding what a dog show is. And with the confirmation stuff, it's basically stacking up your dog versus the uh, industry standard setting of what this dog is. And, and putting that in my mind make it, makes it a lot make, uh, makes it a lot makes it make a lot more sense. That's how my mind works. And uh, when I teach this stuff for work, you know, when I go and I uh, teach soldering classes and I say, this is the industry standard. This is what it should like. It's, this is target condition versus acceptable or defect. This is how my mind processes what a dog show is. It's stacking up your dog versus what is like the basic def not even basic definition the target standard for what your dog should look like you know the top of the top the best of the best stuff like that 
So we went to this dog show and I actually got to walk Sonny and Raz around in the ring and uh, um, show them off. And uh, Raz, what was really cool is he was supposed to be a show dog, but he had so many health issues that it was really hard to show him off. But when he did get uh, those chances to show off, he did really well. He might not have been perfect, especially when you're dealing with a ton of other dogs in that category, but he won ribbons and prizes, and he is a, he even has a plaque uh, in our little dog uh, room area in our um, other room of our house. And so seeing those ribbons that he won it means a lot to me. So we gave him just the best life that we could. and. His circumstances, man, they were rough. He had a rough life. And not rough like a rough, rough like a dog. <laughs> but he had a pretty difficult life. And, man, he was a trooper. He really did try the best to just... He was always energetic and always happy and always loving. And it was... It was tough sometimes dealing with him because he just had energy for days. You know, I would come home and let him out. And I'm exhausted after a day of work. Come home, let him out. Then I got to go cook dinner. And I come back and, you know, I let him back in uh, from the backyard. And he sprints up the stairs. And he would launch himself at you. He nailed me in the face with his nose and jaw and teeth so many times just by wanting to go, oh my gosh, Ryan, you're here and I'm here. Love me. <laughs> and man, it was incredible to uh, spend time with him. He, he loved just hanging out. You know, he would, he was a big, massive dog for a pit bull. He wasn't even supposed to be that big. He was bigger than he actually was supposed to get. And so he would climb on our laps, you know, in a chair or on the couch and just want to cuddle and just lay down and just say, hey, I love you. I love you. Let me lick your face. And it was it was really fun um, being with him and loving him and getting loved by him. So <sighs> hanging out with him uh, was really fun. And he would also, um, I I would have to kind of, spend uh put him away every once in a while because I would try and hang out with him but he was just so loving he would always want someone to pet him or just have their hand on him just to uh say hey I'm here don't worry I'm here uh so I would have um this recording studio and uh, uh work area and stuff where my tool benches and you know all my tools and stuff uh, I call it the murder room and so I would have the murder room open uh, to their dog room. And Raz, Sonny didn't really want to hang out, but Raz would always want to hang out. And he would just lay at my feet or at my side. And he would try and put his head on the armrest, but he was a very drooly dog uh, too. So the armrest is just covered in Raz drool, uh, just layers of it. And um, just hanging out with him, you know, every once in a while after like, an hour or so of, hey, pet me, pet me, pet me, pet me. I'm right here. I'm right here. Uh, he would finally kind of calm down a little bit and lay at my feet or at my side and just hang out with me in the murder room. And I really, really loved that. So in honor of our dog Raz, um, I just wanted to talk about him a little bit because he was a really good dog, and I miss him a lot. And knowing he's up there in puppy heaven, hanging out with Nemo, uh, our cat that passed away the year before. Um, and it makes me happy that he's not in pain. You know, he's not uh, dealing with any of those health issues that he had. He had to deal with a lot of medication. And no dog, no animal should have to deal with that medication on a daily or bi-daily uh, basis. He had it in the morning, had to have special food, you know, and we loved him. He was such a good dog. Oh my gosh. So I just, I, I needed to talk about Raz on uh, somewhere. And I'm sorry if uh, 
you don't care about my dog or don't want to listen to me sit here and barely fight back tears talking about my dog. But hey, this is my podcast. So I'm going to do what I want. So in honor of Raz, I wanted to talk about him a little bit. And I also just wanted to uh, dedicate this podcast to him, ep- special episode 15. Um, I'm titling it uh, See You Space Cowboy. And I think it's I was going to title it maybe something a little bit similar, maybe uh, rework uh, the phrasing a little bit to add psychonauts in there. But um, I think it's it's interesting Um, where I got this title from is it's just the quote at the end or I think it's at the end of uh, Cowboy Bebop. It's an anime and I'm not an anime fan by any stretch, Um, but there are certain animes that I really do like. And the reason why is because just like any medium, there's good and bad. With anime, I think there is a lot more bad than there is good, but there are tons of good animes out there. Um, I think I might have talked about this on one of the other episodes. One of my favorite animes was called Kids on the Slope. And it's a slice of life anime, which basically means it's kind of there's no superpowers or anything like this. It's just kind of a slice of a character's life that you get to kind of see day in, day out their normal lives being played out on the uh, TV. And so uh, Kids on the Slope, it deals with uh, this kid in like 1980s Japan. Um, that moves to a new city, doesn't have any friends, tries to make friends at school, and is really into jazz. And so the jazz sessions that he makes with these uh, friends and musicians at like this coffee shop or something, I I watched it when it came out, and that was like 2011, 2012 maybe. Um, it was only like 16 episodes maybe, something like that. You know, Japan, anime stuff is weirdly seasoned. So... That's one of them, but there was another one. I was like, oh, Kids kids on the Slope is really good. Maybe I should watch another type of anime. And so uh, I remember talking with uh, my friend Brady and Jeff and just, you know, other people uh, throughout my life when, whenever anime would get brought up, it was always, hey, have you watched Cowboy Bebop? And I was like, Cowboy Bebop, that sounds dumb. Like, I love cowboys. I love the Western genre, but... They would always tell me, oh, it's sci-fi. It's this guy about, it has a spaceship and he kind of is like a bounty hunter. And it's, uh, and I was like, oh, so it's like the sci-fi Western. And I think the only good sci-fi Western that's ever been produced was Firefly. Because it really does have a lot of Westerning type of themes in there and tropes. But I gave it a shot. And again, this was back in like 2012. So I gave Cowboy Bebop a shot. And at the end of every episode, it kind of caps it off, you know, says, hey, this is this little story, the little side story. There's an overarching storyline to that uh, show, but most of them are standalone bottle episodes. A lot of them can just be, uh, you know, put together like, hey, here's a adventure that these characters go through. And so at the end of every episode, it says, see you, Space Cowboy. And that's always stuck with me and just like a really cool phrase, kind of just saying, all right, see you along. And, uh, you know, with uh, keeping with the Western theme of that hero riding off in the sunset and, you know, not knowing what's ahead and all this stuff. I thought it was just a really cool phrase for um, sending off the memory of Raz. And so that's kind of... um, what I'm going to title it. And that's the the idea or the um, thought behind the title of this episode. I usually try and make the episodes fun and, you know, and I don't want to be dour, or, um, downtrodden by this episode, but it's something I needed to talk about and get off my chest. So dedicating this uh, episode to Raz. See you, space cowboy. All right. Well, and take a little bit of a break here and I'm going to play a little bit of music that reminds me of Raz so here you go I love you guys
So, after that, sorry about that, but like I said, I needed to get it off my chest. Anyways, video games, man. I've been, um, again, because of all the stuff that's been going on in my life the last couple of weeks, video games haven't been super big in my life the last couple of weeks. And it's a bummer, too, because it's my birth month. Uh, like I talked about on the previous episode, my birthday is in uh, on September 10th, and the last couple of weeks I've just been kind of not really playing a whole lot, but I have played some stuff. First thing I want to talk about is uh, Control, a game from Remedy, and <sighs> I love Remedy. Remedy is a fantastic developer. They have uh, made the first two Max Payne titles. They uh, made the Alan Wake series, and I say series in quotations because they made Alan Wake, that came out in 2010, and then they made Alan Wake's American Nightmare, which was a downloadable only, standalone, kind of separate offshoot game. It was a much smaller game. Uh, It took about an hour and a half, two hours maybe, I think, to uh, finish it compared to Alan Wake, which was like full-blown video game. And uh, it didn't really do anything different, just had a different setting, but the setting was very small and not as uh, interesting. So they did Max Payne, ser- uh, the first two Max Paynes, which is uh, like a, a gritty cop film noir type of genre. Um, that series also introduced bullet time back in the early 2000s. Remember Matrix? Yeah, like they put the Matrix bullet time effect into Max Payne. It was the first video game that ever did that. And it just kind of blew up and it was really cool just diving in slow motion and shooting guns and all this stuff. And then Alan Wake was a game that took inspiration, again, using air quotes, uh, from Twin Peaks, because there's a not even just a lot of similarities, but a lot of just like cribbing, a lot of homages, I guess, um, to the Twin Peaks TV show. And I hate scary games. I hate them. I hate them. I hate them. But Alan Wake, there is something special about it, even though it's weird and creepy and awkward and uh, just off putting in a sense. It was interesting enough, and it, it plays a lot off a lot of uh, Twin Peaks and Stephen King tropes. So I really enjoyed it, and I played that back in twenty no twenty thirteen maybe, and I was just like, "Wow, Alan Wake is fantastic! I can't wait till they make another one." And then they instead of making Alan Wake two, Remedy. Uh, was uh, basically uh, commissioned to do the game called Quantum Break for Microsoft and their Xbox One. And I believe it was shown off on the launch for Xbox One. And so I was like, oh, that's kind of a bummer. They're not doing Alan Wake 2. And Quantum Break just did terribly. I did not even finish it. I probably will at some point just to kind of get it done and out of the way. But... Quantum Break was basically a game that you were 
expected to play through this game, but in the middle, instead of like having little cutscenes or whatever, they wanted to do this whole like multimedia thing with Xbox One where they basically put a TV show in the middle of the game. And every little chapter end or whatever, or act end, you would have to sit through an episode of TV, basically. A 20, 22 minute long cutscene that was acted out by real actors. They had um, uh, the guy from Fringe, the Speak to Me uh, guy. I can't remember his name. Uh, they had um, some other famous famous actors. I cannot remember the Sean Ashmore, um, and it just broke the, up the flow of the game for me. And like I said, if I do finish it at some point, I'll probably talk about it. Um, but that was why I stopped playing because it was like. I don't care about this TV show. Like, I want to play the game. If you want to make this TV show, make it a TV show. Don't mix and match parts of the game with parts of a TV show and then mesh them together and expect it to gel well, because I don't think it did at all. So they did Quantum Break, and then they uh, announced Control relatively recently. Uh, I think it was earlier last year, maybe around E3. They said, hey, Remedy is coming out with a new game. It's not uh, Quantum Break 2. It's not Alan Wake 2. It's called Control. And you are this character who has psychic abilities. And everyone was talking about PsyOps. And PsyOps was a really good game for the Xbox and PS2, but I did not care for it all that much. I thought it was just a very uh, B game, a budget title. Like, uh, hey, here's this like mid-tier game that just is kind of out there. And you could pick it up if you want to, but it wasn't like AAA development or anything like that. So um, PsyOps is the one that uh, everyone talks about. I was always gravitating towards Second Sight, the Free Radicals, the uh, Free Radical developed game that uh, is the developers of um, not, it, yes, Hayes, and everyone talks about that, but uh, they did the Time Splitter series. And if you know anything about me and Time Splitters, I love the Time Splitters franchise. The reason why I love it is not just because the games are good, but they're also the development team of Free Radical was uh, the development team at Rare. Uh, some ex-Rare employees that made Goldeneye and Perfect Dark. And if you play the Time Splitters games, you'll actually hear some of the Goldeneye sound effects um, in Time Splitters. And so I always love Free Radical. So I always thought Second Sight was the better of the two psychic games. It's kind of like that whole thing with um, movies where two development studios uh, make very similar movies at the exact same times. Ants and A Bug's Life, um, Volcano and Deep Impact. Or no, no, no. Volcano and Dante's Peak, uh, Deep Impact and Armageddon. You know how uh, those, those types of movies always come out in twos, basically. Same thing uh, there. So... Control is basically this game where you are this lady. And the game just kind of thrusts you into this. And I really liked the game. I found it very, very fun. It was just, it's got that Remedy vibe, man. There's something weird and off-putting about their games where they're a Finnish studio from Finland. And so the way they talk, the way that they... um build their environments and narrative storylines is just a little bit different than here in America or Britain. You know, it's just, it, it's something special and unique. And that's why I think these games are so well done by Remedy. Even though Quantum Break really wasn't that, they, they tried at least, tried something different. You know, I'd, I'd rather take, most of the time, I'd rather take something different than something the exact same thing over and over and over again, like Madden or something like that. It's the same exact game every year. So you're this lady and you're searching for your brother. Your brother's gone missing. He's been captured by this kind of secret orga a government organization. And so at the very beginning of the game, this isn't even spoilers. This is literally the beginning of the game and setting up the plot is you're searching for your brother. You walk into this building that you just found and you've been searching for it a long time. It's called the uh, Bureau of Control. And so the Bureau, uh, Federal Bureau of Control 
is like just the what you think of as a government building, just black concrete or uh, is a gray concrete slab type of interface, um, kind of like in Men in Black. You know, when they walk into the building and there's those two giant fans spinning um, and it's just a very sterile environment. They got the one guard um, and then they go into the elevator and then as as they get out of the elevator, then all the aliens are there and all the cool stuff. Same thing here with control. It's that type of aesthetic. So they put this, <laughs> you, you walk into this building and no one's around and you're just like, what is going on? And this is like literally the first like three, four minutes of the game. Walking around, no one's, go- no one's there, no one's around. You're like, what is happening? So you walk down a couple hallways and stuff, and you run into this janitor, and he's, fi- again, Finnish. Um, so he speaks in a very thick accent, really hard to understand. So subtitles are a must. And you're like, hey, where is uh, the director? Where is, you know, the, the main guy I need to talk to you about my brother? He's missing, and I think he's here. This janitor dude is speaking in riddles and rhymes and um, colloquialisms and stuff like that. And he's just basically like, yeah, go over there. Uh, It's down the hall. And so um, you go down the hall and you see the uh, you hear as you're walking towards the director's office. Again, no one's around hear a gunshot and you're like, oh, crap. So you run and the director, the main guy is just sitting there dead. You know, he shot himself. You're like, oh, crap, and there's a gun there. But it's not like just normal, like, revolver or handgun or anything like that. It's like this weird alien device. But they don't say alien, and it's not an alien device. It's a paranormal gun. And the gun just kind of, you gravitate towards it. You're like, oh, what what is this gun? And the gun technically picks you, kind of like, I guess the sorting hat in uh, Harry Potter. I don't know those books or uh, movies, but it, it kind of picks you. It's it's sentient in a way. And so you pick up the gun and now you are the director of the Federal Bureau of Control. And this is where I kind of have an issue with the game. And again, this is the first couple of minutes of the game. You are a character who has been searching and searching and searching for your lost brother and you want answers. And as soon as you get to the building, you now just randomly are assumed control of this government organization. You are the highest of the higher ups randomly out of nowhere. And everyone that you come across in the game, is like, Oh, you're the new director. Hey boss, how's this going? Tell me what to do. And you're like, how am I supposed to tell you what to do? I don't even know what this is. And so it, maybe it's those, hey, you know, greatness is thrust upon you and you got to rise up and uh, all that type of stuff. But it just it comes off a little weird because you have no idea what's going on. And it's just it's it's a little awkward. It's a little weird. But if you push that off to the side underneath that, underneath the kind of lame storytelling. I don't really care about the storytelling of the game. The main narrative of the game is kind of filler to me. It's not interesting. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But the mechanics, the underlying gameplay of Control is what brings this game to greatness. It is something that, oh, it's so fun to play. It's one of those games that you start playing, and as you play through it, you start really understanding what the game is. And it's a shooter, you know? It's a third-person shooter game with uh, based in physics. And th- what's really cool about saying it's a third-person shooter game is the shooting part is the least fun and something that is not really even... Uh, addressed in the game that much. It's just like a hey, here's this this shooting mechanic. It's there if you want it, but that's not what we're here about. The main fun part of this game is uh, the powers that the gun bestows upon you, and as you progress through the story, you unlock better abilities and powers. So you get this. Um, you're running through the the building, and you find out what happened to everyone. 
there's what is what your character dubs the hiss. And again, this is part of why I think the story is a little weird is because you're just some person literally off the street that walks in five minutes. You're the director and everyone who's been here for 20, 30, 40 years who's been dealing with this day in, day out, the government, uh, crazy weird stuff like men in black type style. They know all this stuff and you are go- you walk off the street and you go, okay, um, this weird uh, being, this swarm-like smoke monster from Lost type of thing is taking control of everyone. and. Some of those people are not turned into bad guys. Some of them are. The people who are not turned into bad guys are just kind of levitating in the air, like being held in stasis. The people who are turned into bad guys are given uh, guns and and they're trying to kill you. And this whole government building, this kind of like Area 51 meets Men in Black, um, they this building contains a lot of weird stuff that just happens in the world and is not explained again like men in black that's why i think it's such a good analogy because everyone's seen those movies and understands men in black covers a lot of stuff up uh that is unexplained or extraterrestrial this isn't really extraterrestrial like aliens this is more like weird crap that no one really knows why it's happening so this weird smoke monster thing you call the hiss and the hiss is taking control of everyone, turning some people bad, turning other people into weird um, levitating, uh, you know, husks. And everyone just kind of goes, oh, OK, the hiss. Just because the director said it once, you know, and, and it just it, again, it just comes off a little weird. But. This government facility basically contains all these anomalies and stuff and. What's really fun about the world building of this game is you, you're you just stuck in this building. That's all you are. You are stuck in the building through the entire game. You don't walk outside. You don't go to different locations. You are just in this weird government building. And the government building is like this ever-changing, ship-shifting uh, type of building that is called the oldest house. And that just sounds rad. So the oldest house is kind of like an entity to itself it's a weird sentient creature building if you it wants you to find it it will allow you to or it will kind of fade into obscurity and not allow you to find it if you're not looking for it it's going to change its shape and geometry the uh, layout of the building moves and uh, shape shifts and stuff like that and so once you start getting the hang of it it's really interesting. It's really cool. So you go through and you find these uh, objects of power and um, altered items and things like that. And these little everyday objects are imbued with this supernatural ability. And if you cleanse them from this unnatural super uh, natural ability, it will give you powers. And there's a couple powers that you get throughout the game. You get levitation, so you can kind of float and fly around. You get telekinesis, so you can pick things up and throw them. And that's the main point of contact, or, or um, not contact, main point of um, uh, combat for this game is telekinesis. You have your gun, but your gun is kind of a last resort. It, there's no ammo but it does have a temperature slash recharging phase. So you got 15 shots, let's say, in the handgun, and it will morph to handgun, shotgun, railgun, and something else. I can't remember. Um, So you you can swap out the ability of the gun on the fly and say, I need a handgun for this. I need a shotgun for close range. And there's no limited ammo it's all unlimited it's a recharging mechanic and so you got let's say 15 shots after 15 shots you got to let it recharge and it will just give you back those 15 shots afterwards but there's a cool down time so it's like oh okay cool so you swap in and out 
uh, and I just use the the um, telekinesis and levitation and stuff like that. And you have like kind of a um, a not teleport, but like a blink type of ability where you kind of flash forward a little bit or to the sides and dodge. Um, those are the three main uh, powers that you get, and it's just oh, man. It's fun. It's a fun mechanic. It's a fun game to play and move. The movement feels fun. That's the thing about this game is, you know, there's a lot of people who talk about like um, games like Assassin's Creed or Witcher, um, where the movement of the character throws or or even Red Dead 2 for some stupid reason. Uh, The movement of the character is such a big sticking point because they feel weighted down and in certain games, yes, you should absolutely feel that. Like Red Dead, that's, I, I mean, you're a Western. It's, it's slow paced. You're not sprinting at a thousand miles per hour. Uh, people died at like the age of 30. Uh, that was like long living and stuff like that. So I think it depends on the game. In this game, you are throwing things. You got supernatural abilities and the layout of the game is a little hard because the map is not very well designed. So you got this map and it's um, location based. So what you do is you go to an area and you have like the central hub area where like there's no encounters. It's a safe space. And then you have to navigate through this building. Well, like I said before, the building itself is kind of living and breathing. And so it blocks you off in certain areas until you cleanse another area. And then once you cleanse that area, it will open itself itself to you. Kind of like in uh, The Three Amigos. It will open herself up to you. Uh, that's kind of what it does. So you play around with this game long enough, you'll open up all the other areas. Certain areas are there for you to explore, but then it kind of gets blocked off. And you're like, where do I go? Where do I go? Where do you, where do you go? And you have to realize uh, you might pick up some objectives or missions that you can't get to right away. And the map is so poorly designed that you don't really use it all that much. Because you don't realize, oh, I, this place is blocked off and I don't have that power yet. And I do wish the game kind of told you, you know, there, there's some like a Tomb Raider and stuff like that. The new Tomb Raiders do this very well where it's an open-ish ended world and there's certain areas you just cannot access yet. You don't have the proper tools or the abilities. So what Lara does in Tomb Raider is she goes, oh, I'll, I think I have to come back here. I don't have the stuff yet. It just a little elemental, like a verbal confirmation saying, hey, you shouldn't be here yet. You can't go any further. Stop trying to get past this because you are not allowed to. You cannot get past this gap or something. So that would have helped a lot. Other than that, what the game does is it will actually uh, do this really, really cool thing where... <laughs> um. The signs in the game are actually real, and it points you in the right directions. Most games don't do this. Most games, uh, text is so hard to read on walls and signs and papers that it, you cannot really uh, tell where to go by just in the environment. The environment is, doesn't have the right information. They did that in this game. There's lots of points where you... Um, kind of dimension travel a little bit and there's like these portals to a uh, hotel or a motel lobby it's called the lakeview lobby uh, motel or something like that lakeside hotel and th- th- it's activated by this uh pull chain light bulb <clears throat> excuse me and so this pull chain light bulb will actually you it, it has a sign in front of it and it's all kind of like blocked off and like made to look special, and it says, hey, this is the Lakeside Hotel, or Motel, Uh, pull three times to activate. And you got to do that in the game. And it's the only way you know how to do that is by looking at the sign that's in front of it in the game. There's no menu. There's no voiceover narration. There's no way to know this unless you look at the sign and read the sign in the game world. 
And it's incredible that, A, you can read the text because most games can't even do that well. But then also it just tells you that. And so you learn while playing this game. That's what I think this game does really well is it makes you not just think outside the box a little bit, but makes you think in real world applications instead of thinking this is a video game what is a video game going to make me do oh i'm at a boss i gotta uh, hit it three times and it's going to be a pattern of three you know that's all things in in video games that are just taken for granted over the several decades that we've had video games for but control kind of bucks that it says nope forget that i'm not going to do that i'm going to make you think in the real world you got to look at signs. You got to walk through a corridor and you're at a T intersection and it has a, um, you know, a directory. You got to look at the directory and say, OK, well, if I go to the right, what areas are that? Oh, it's the cafeteria and the psychology department. And if I go to the left, it's the main office and um, the mail room. You know, stuff like that is so cool and no video games do it. And it was really hard to kind of push my mind in that direction but once i kind it kind of clicked with me made the game so much easier so it's really cool it does something to that just just unique you know that you don't see a whole lot in video games so i'm gonna speak broadly uh just so i don't spoil anything but uh remedy does a lot of moments in games where there is a section a cool, you know, little moment or two or 10 or whatever in their games that just kind of stand out. You know, one of them in the Max Payne series is the nightmare levels. Nightmare levels stand out because they're so different than anything in games. Uh, In Alan Wake, I think there was a uh, music moment where they used um, like a concert to uh, kind of show a lot of changes in the world and stuff like that. And it's, it's a moment in that game where you go, oh man, that was so cool. I want to do that again. Control has that as well. Control actually has this super cool moment that has to deal with uh, this maze-like structure. And I'm not going to spoil it, but again, once you get there and you, un- you start going through the maze and you unlock the ability that allows you to traverse through it, it is like, un- it's unlike anything in games, man. This is why Remedy is awesome. They do these little one-off shot things that don't happen anywhere else in the game or in any other games, and it makes them stand out, stand above the crowd. And so it was really cool. So once you get through like this, the game and stuff like that, and you kind of defeat the big bad, you get into this ending and there's false, there's kind of a false ending in this game. And it was interesting to see. I don't think, I think it went on a little bit too long just because it was like, okay, I get it. Um, And you kind of noticed what they were trying to get at and you kind of have to do it multiple times. And I'm not a big fan of doing the same thing multiple, multiple, multiple times in games. But it was really, really fun. Uh, And the ending was, again, unique, interesting, and just cool. Um, And then uh, the actual ending I did not care for as much because of the story. The story just kind of, again, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So. Take that for what it's worth. I think the game itself is fantastic. It's definitely up there in one of the better games of this year, probably on the top 10 slot. Um, but just play Control, man. It's worth the 60 bucks. You know, it's probably going to come down in price pretty soon, but it's definitely worth it. You, you will not be disappointed by that game. So that is Control. I'm going to take a little bit of a break here, um, play a little bit of music, and then I will come back and talk about a couple other games, uh, Westworld Awakening for VR, and then also Gears 5.
Okay, so. First game, Westworld. This game came out um, a couple, I'd say about a week before my birthday. And I was looking for some new VR game to get into. I'm still going through No Man's Sky. I'm having a lot of fun with it. I just put it down for a little bit because I want something new. Just something different. So with Westworld, man, ugh, this show on HBO, holy crap, this this show is so stinking good. It, it finished up its second season last year, and it looks like we've got a bit of waiting to do before the next season comes out, probably uh, maybe in springtime of 2020. So why they put this out now, I have no idea, but it's a really cool idea, not just for a show about the or a game about the show, but also a VR game. Like if you have no idea what Westworld is about, basically you uh it, it's a show about uh a, a little bit in the future there's a theme park that uh, uses very very lifelike um robots and it's all set in the uh, old west and so these um People come and try to experience the Old West in a setting where everything is controlled. All the characters and the livestock and everything are all um, look like humans in real life, you know, animals and things like that. But they're actually robots. And so um, the characters, the robots are called hosts. And in the show, the hosts you know, it, it deals with sentience and uh, does a robot have feelings and, and waking up and learning that they're a robot and their thoughts are not their own. They're pre-programmed and all this stuff. So when Westworld came out, it was awesome. Ben, this was back in 2016 uh, and the second season aired last year in 2018. So this VR game, it's uh, about three, three and a half. I think it took me about three and a half hours to finish up. And I loved every minute of it. It's got a really cool setting, but it's very, very linear. So basically, you play one of the hosts. Her name is uh, Kate Wesson. And you go through this scenario of you're kind of dropped in a little uh, in front of a house, and you've inherited the house from your you know great uncle or something like that, kind of semi-distant relative. So you go into the house, and there is a lawyer, you know, finishing up the paperwork. And so you do like very basic things, walk around, find a key, open the door, look at some of the documents, and you're just kind of walking around and looking at stuff and picking uh, very basic items up like papers and pictures and uh, little trinkets and stuff like that. And I spent a good like 15, 20 minutes just doing that in the very, very beginning of this game. And come to realize... Uh, someone else is in the house and you you finally show up to where the lawyer is and the lawyer is murdered. And you're like, oh, crap, someone's in the house with me. They're going to kill me. I got to get out. And it goes through, you know, like the horror type of um, type of genre where you're hiding under tables and stuff like that and just trying to get away from this murder a murderer. And then you freeze up and you're not allowed to move. And you look in the bottom right corner and it says all motor functions frozen. And this is something that Westworld, the TV show, does is when uh, a character or a host gets, you know, out of line or they need to run diagnostics or whatever, their programming freezes them up so that they can't move and they, their motor functions are frozen. And so it just takes a lot of stuff from the show and puts it into the game. And it makes you feel like you're living the TV show. And it's really, really cool. Like, I love when games and movies and stuff like, or, or games do stuff like that, where it makes you feel like you're in the environment, but you're not going directly through, like, a scene or something. You know, I remember when my friend Andrew and I would used to talk about, like, oh, man, this would this movie would be great if they made a video game on it. I remember... We went to go see the original um, Mummy movie, you know, the Brendan Fraser one, not, you know, 1939, obviously. 
But when we went to go see that in theaters, I remember going out of the theater and walking out to have our moms pick us up or whatever. And we were talking about, oh, man, you know, this scene would have been great if if it was a video game. Can you imagine what they would do? And, you know, and trying to relive those moments. And back then I thought it was cool. But now reliving moments in games are not that amazing. Um you want something new, a, a different take on the scenario and stuff like that. So I really like what this game does. It takes parts of that show and puts it into the game, but it makes it its own. It's unique. So I really, really like that about this game. So your motor functions are freezing or frozen. Uh, the murder gets you. And uh, as you scream and watch a knife go into your face, uh, everything becomes a little bit digital, uh, digital, digitized, and uh, you move uh, into a. Uh, you kind of wake up in a lab, and two scientists or, or people in lab coats, technicians, are basically talking over you in front of you, and um, kind of going through diagnostic setup because you are a robot, and. You run the scenario multiple times, but things have changed. You know, the the murderer is now wearing a sack over his head or he's got a cleaver instead of a knife or a machete or, you know, whatever it is. And it makes you go through the same scenario several times and you kind of really get why these robots, these hosts are pissed off and upset. Their quote unquote lives are being taken advantage of and they're programmed to you know especially with your character you're programmed to relive these horrific terrible scary moments over and over and over and over again and it kind of sticks in your mind or you have little deja vu moments of wait i think i know this or i think this has happened before but wasn't that over here instead and, you know Kind of like the Matrix and stuff like that. So it's a really, really cool the way that they designed this game. So if you have VR, I know it's a little pricey at around 30 bucks for about three, three and a half hours of, you know, a game where you'll probably only play it once. You know, it's definitely once you see the hook, once you've experienced it, there's not a whole lot of replayability. But at the same time, I think developers should be rewarded for trying something new or advancing the VR medium or, you know, even just creating something cool. I debated on it for a couple days if I should buy this or not. And I was like, dude, it's my birthday. I'm going to play this. I'm going to buy it. It's 30 bucks. Who cares? And I bought it and I loved the crap out of it. I really do wish it was a little bit less linear. Or, you know, they added a. DLC option or opened it up a little bit to where you can experience, you know, the town. Um, I think it's saltwater, whatever, um, the town in the show, and be able to play around it and look at everything and the animatronics of the hosts and just kind of hang out in there a little bit, just give it a little bit more replayability because the only things in the game that would allow you to want to replay it is there are hidden collectibles. There's little tiny figurines hidden throughout the, the game in the levels. But other than that, they don't unlock anything. They're just kind of there to say, hey, you know, I, I went off the beaten path a little bit because, again, it's very, very linear. Um, so it just doesn't give you a whole lot of extra options to come back to it multiple times. and. I would love to because I thought it was phenomenal and the the facial animation for these characters when these uh, technicians are standing in front of you running their diagnostics and they're talking to each other, you can tell that's where a major part of the budget went and it shows and it's incredible. You know, I think we were all blown away by L.A. Noir when that came out. And Team Bondi's facial capture animation. This blows it out of the water. This looks like makes that stuff look like child's play. And it is just really, really cool to put on a headset and be 
actually in that world of Westworld. So if you like the TV show, if you got a VR headset, you don't mind paying a little bit more for for quality. That's I think the uh, main thing for this game is you're paying for quality over replayability. And in certain cases, and this might be one of them, it's worth it. Um, so hopefully, you know, uh, this does well enough for it to, you know, get some more recognition, maybe come out with a sequel in, after season three comes out or uh, maybe even just tack on something. I highly doubt there's ever going to be a sequel or anything. It just it feels like it was a hey, you know, we want to mess around with VR, you know, and we're a development team. Let's get the license and, you know, have at it. Put it out there for 30 bucks, see how well it does. And, you know, I haven't really heard anyone talking about this game in such a bummer because it is really, really unique. And it's it, especially with VR where there's so many um, arena shooters or gallery shooters like this stands out. And it's really cool, too, because this isn't like a shooter type of game, you know, that a lot of VR games rely on shooting. And when you wake up and uh, all the hosts have started to turn and everything like that, there's a guard and yeah, on his body, there's a gun. And when you try and grab the gun from the guard's body, there's a little message that pops up and says, this isn't that type of game. It's like an achievement or something like kind of a little Easter egg. And you go, oh, OK, this is something different. This is something a little bit more unique. And I mean, it's not even that unique because it is more of a walking simulator. But I think that term has a very negative uh, connotation to it, which it doesn't deserve. I love walking simulators. I think they're fantastic. I think they're some of the best games because I love narrative in my games. I do think there needs to be a balance because something like Dear Esther, there's nothing. Something like Gone Home, there's picking up objects and looking at them, but that's about it. I want a, a, a game that relies heavily on narrative, relies mostly on experiencing and, and living in the world, but I want a little bit more than just being able to pick up a few pictures and interact with certain items. Another, uh, before I move on, another really cool thing is uh, this game does allow for a little bit of puzzles and things like that. And basically, you have like this PDA um, that's semi-translucent. And so you pull out the PDA to do um, uh, emotional changes for your character or other characters, just like the TV show. And this PDA also has the thing where you can kind of uh, scan around um, the world. And you can follow like uh, networking pipes and stuff like that. So there are some little puzzle and interactive elements. It's just not a whole lot. And like I said, the puzzles are um, so few and far between and very easy that it's not really a challenge. It's just part of the gameplay. So if you like that type of stuff, I, I wholeheartedly recommend Westworld Awakening on uh, Steam VR. If you a have a VR headset, obviously, and the second is if you don't mind paying for quality and you don't mind saying, I'm going to plop down 30 bucks and have a three hour, three and a half hour experience and then probably never come back to it. I think it's amazing. It's just that is an issue with a lot of VR games is you have to have some replayability there. So that's Westworld. And last game I'm going to talk about is Gears. Gears of War. Fifth one came out, again, on my birthday, which was rad, uh, September 10th. So I loaded it up and I didn't even have to buy it, which is rad because all of Microsoft's products, first anything first party software is on Game Pass for free. So if you have Game Pass, you get the games. Uh, last year was Forza Horizon 4. Um, this year's Gears of War 5, Sea of Thieves, all those types of games. Um, anything first party is instantly day and date um, free with Game Pass. So I, I think that's rad. 
So they dropped the of war part of Gears of War and just made this a uh, uh, numbered sequel and it's called Gears 5. I don't know why, but I think it just makes it easier because everyone calls it Gears instead of Gears of War. I really struggled to like this game at the very beginning. I thought uh, it was kind of boring. They do um, a little bit of recapping, which is nice because with these games, I play them once at launch. I go through the campaign. And that's it. When the second one came out, I did horde mode a little bit because it was brand new and it was like the thing that everyone was talking about. Horde mode. You know, there's um, kind of a a stand your ground multiplayer aspect where you and your friends stand your ground and try and defeat these waves of enemies that come at you. And it was really cool and novel back then for multiplayer. So I played a little bit of that, but I, for the most part, I stay away from multiplayer in all games because I think it's boring for the most part. Uh, every game has to have a deathmatch. And dude, like I've said a million times, deathmatch, I did that in 1996. So I'm done. I don't need any more of that. Uh, so I'm only sticking with the campaign and I only play them at launch. When these games come out, they're kind of the big spectacle thing. I always want to be able to talk to people and listen to conversations without having spoilers so i play them right as soon as they come out same thing with this game and the game before it so gears one two and three that came out on the xbox 360 finished up that original trilogy with marcus phoenix this new trilogy four five and now six that's going to come out in a couple years after this is uh, starting a new trilogy and it's marcus phoenix's kid uh, JD or James and his band of buddies uh, doing their whole um, killing the swarm and the locusts and all that stuff. I don't care about the kids that much. I don't think they're very interesting. I equate it to like a Muppet Babies version. It's just like these are kid versions and I, I, I care more about the characters that, you know, I played in the original trilogies, just like with Star Wars as well. I don't care about any other characters. Because they're just there to uh, be a new character instead of dragging out the old characters. And they try and make you feel for them and focus on them and give them interesting storylines, I guess. But I'm just, I'm really not invested in the story of Gears of War. I like the gameplay. I think that they do what they do very, very well. But again, it's a one and done for me. I play it, I beat it, and I move on. And I don't go back to them ever. I've never gone back to Gears of War 1, 2, or 3, or 4. And I never will because they're just kind of like summer blockbusters. There's not a whole lot of feeling or, uh, you know, just that that sense of, oh my gosh, this is a amazing story. The characters are so well told. It's just, it's a popcorn game. You know, and these characters are very one dimensional, especially in the original trilogy. The new trilogy tries to add a little bit more and stuff. And uh, even Gears 2 tried to do the whole thing with, I think it was Dom and his wife, uh, stuff like that. So I'm not saying that they don't have heart. I'm just saying they don't do it very well. And I don't care about that. And I'm usually, uh, again, just like I was talking about with Westworld, I'm a big proponent of story in games because i don't think that a lot of it is very very well told so when they're trying to make me care about these characters that i see once every few years you know i'm just like eh whatever so when you start up the game there's a previously on previously on gears of war you know they recap the first game and kind of hit the major bullet points which was really nice because again i could pull two things out of my memory from Gears of War 4. It was, uh, I'm not playing as Marcus Phoenix. I'm playing as his son. And there's a level where you go to the house and it reveals Marcus. And then you try to get him to go along with your crazy scheme. He finally does. The bad guys show up and destroy the house. That's the first memory. The other part is the very, very end, which is the only thing that most people remember is, oh, the girl, um, her grandma is or her mom was um, like uh, taken and uh, she gives her a necklace and finds out she's like a queen or something like that, you know, of the locust and she's technically a bad guy or whatever. 
that's it. So they play the recap, and then you're thrust into this game. And the first two acts, I was just bored to tears, man. I like I I played them late at night, and I was like, I'm just gonna sit down and play these. I'm not really invested, but I like the mechanics well enough. I like the gameplay aspect of these games, so I'll give it a shot. And I went through, and I just I found it very boring. I found it just like I don't care about these characters. I don't like the setting that much. Eh, well, just get me through this game so that I can talk about it on the podcast, basically. Uh, so I started going through it. In the second act, uh, they drop you into this ice world, and it's a very open-ended type of thing. And you go through this town that's like a fishing town. And, uh, you know, you're supposed to care about these things, and it just it feels kind of like almost like a play like every single character that you see has one line that they have to say when they get in earshot of you and once you walk past them they uh turn off you know they're almost like robots in a way and it just it felt so stale and i was just like this sucks i don't even know if i'm going to finish this game and then they drop you into this open world that is just empty. There is literally nothing to do in this open world except for go to point A to point B. They open it up a little tiny bit by having like little tiny outposts that you can kind of go to and there's an enemy encounter, but it doesn't feel like a living, breathing world. Like I said, it feels like a play. Everything, it's like um, uh, the Truman Show. Everything is there for the character, and it serves the purpose of the character, and that's it. It doesn't feel like a living, breathing, real world where every character is doing their own thing, and you just happen to be a part of it. It's you are the 100% main focus, and everything else is focusing in on you. And wherever you go, their eyes meet, and it like it, it can follow you. And it's just, it's weird. It's weird. So. I got to the third act, which drops you into a new area, which is instead of an ice world and ice forest, it drops you into a red sand dune uh, open world. Same thing here. There's nothing there for you except for the few uh, points of interest that you are supposed to go to and, and make up the levels of these games. But that's about it. I will say, this game, when it wants to, it looks beautiful. It is a really nice looking game, but that's not saying a whole lot anymore. What game doesn't look good? Indie games, and that's about it. Any triple A game looks amazing. It is always one of the talking points whenever people talk about these games. And I just don't think that's very interesting all that much anymore. It's something that I just. Yeah, I know. It looks good. They all look good. This is nothing new. So I wanted to say that because I do think the aesthetic of, of the design of the levels are really cool. When you're in the ice world, you go into a forest area and you got all these trees that are frozen over and it, it just it is rad looking. And they do really cool stuff with storms in these games, the last two games. So you have like this crazy thunder ice storm that that is going on during the uh, forest area. And it just it's a really cool experience. But there is, again, just not enough there. It's a it's a hallway simulator. It's the issue that I had with Final Fantasy 13. You go from here to here, here to here, here to here. And that's it. And you can't really deviate too much. There might be a little enclave or, or something like that, but that's about it it so you go through uh the ice world you get to the sand world and again same thing the artist and, and the uh, uh design of these levels are rad you're in like this airport that has been abandoned overtaken by the environment and so all the windows are shattered and these just brown red you know adobe looking sand is pouring in and just kind of taking over everything. And it looks like it's been abandoned for 15, 20, 30, 40 years. And it is just really, really cool looking. And it kind of reminded me of Uncharted 
The Uncharted series in three, this is the thing that I love. I really like Uncharted three, and I know a lot of people don't. Uncharted three had this, uh, I think it was like the first level where you go into this abandoned mansion in the middle of France. And everything is the same thing, abandoned. Uh, Nature is taken over. Trees are breaking into the house and, and tearing apart the roof and everything like that. And it is just really cool to be in. Same thing with Gears. It's just your character moves a little too slow. Everything's a little bit bulky and there's not really anything to explore. That's what I wish this game did was allow me to explore. If you're giving me an open world, put stuff in it so that I can explore. There are collectibles that you find and upgrades, but just not a whole lot to do other than those very few minor things. Your robot buddy, Jack, um, that follows you along with a story, uh, he can get upgrades. And that's one of the things that you will go off the beaten path to find is these upgrade collectibles so that you can upgrade Jack throughout the game. Thing is, Jack is worthless. I didn't use him at all, except for the few times that the game funnels you into these tutorial experiences where it says, hey, you need to use this thing that Jack does to get to the next part. We will not let you progress until you use Jack with this thing. So I was just like, ah, fine, whatever. So I did that and I played this game and even with the empty world, there are big set piece moments where all hands were on deck. You know, these were the tent poles of this game. It's holding the game up is this encounter and this encounter. There's an encounter with uh, uh, a Swarmac, just this massive Rancor looking uh, character that the Gears of War series usually likes to use. I think it's a Burmac in the originals. Uh, they mutated. Now it's a Swarmac. It's massive. So the Swarmac uh, bursts through. You're in like this um, this theater that puts on plays. And it's just, it's themed really well. And it's like, man, I just wish I could explore a little bit more. I, I know these there's like these huge areas with uh, thousands of chairs in this auditorium, but can't walk through it. It's all blocked off. It's just there to look at really quick and then move on. And that's what this game does. Everything looks really nice, but you're not there to look at it. It's just supposed to be on the periphery of your vision. Your eyes are on the prize of moving forward, moving through the next hallway, getting to the next enemy encounter or cutscene. And it's just like, oh, it's such a bummer because these games, they could be so much better than they are. And I'm not saying they're bad. I really did enjoy my time with Gears of War. But I just wish it was better. If you're going to take this long to make these games, make them as best as you can. And I think the the campaign, which is how these games are built, you know, um, I mean, that's where the budget goes is these gigantic, massive, multi, 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 multi hour long story lines are all that's where the budget goes to. Why are they five, six, seven hours? You know, oh, because half the other budget or, you know, a small, uh, another chunk of the game is dedicated to horde mode and multiplayer and all this other crap. And it's just like, ugh, don't care about any of that. And especially with this new one, um, they added in uh, some product placement. And I'm just like, really? Really? And in one of them, I guess makes a little bit of sense. It's the Terminator uh, series. You have uh, the new Terminator movies coming out. I don't know when, but they added Sarah Connor from the new one, uh, Linda Hamilton, into the uh, as a character for the multiplayer. And it's like, uh, why? Uh, product placement? That's about it. And I was like, fine, I guess, you know, product placement is the movie's coming out and it, 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 you can make some weird connection that the Terminator franchise deals with time travel and, and alternate history. So that's what this game kind of does. It's, it's a futuristic setting where the human race is on the run from these uh, terrible alien type creatures. Okay, whatever. 
But the one that baffles me is the other character that they got. They got Dave Batista. And I'm a wrestling fan, so I know who Batista is because he was in WWE for a long time. Everyone else might know him from the Marvel movies, Drax the uh, Destroyer from the Guardians of the Galaxy. But he is literally just called Batista. He's the dude, the actor. The actor, Dave Batista, is in Gears of War 5 as a playable character for no reason whatsoever. Why? Why, why not me? Why not James Cameron? Why not uh, Elijah Wood? That makes about as much sense. Elijah Wood should be in Gears of War 5 if Dave Batista can be in Gears of War 5. It just makes no sense. So it's just, it's baffling that I don't know if they paid for him to be in the game or if the uh, company is paying, you know, Microsoft to have him be in the game, if it's a cross-promotional thing or whatever, but he's in the game for unknown reason. So it just, it's awkward and it's a bummer that they're spending, like, when the, before the game comes out, all you hear about is all the storyline stuff because that's where all the budget is. That's what's going to get people to buy this game, as far as I know. But as soon as the game comes out, no one talks about it. No one talks about the campaign. They all talk about it and, and and the messaging behind it, the advertisements for it, and the rest of that game's life is all focused on multiplayer. And yeah, it's there to um, have people spend money on microtransactions. And maybe I'll talk about this more at some other point. I don't care to now. But boy, multiplayer is killing the video game industry. It is shoehorned into so many games, and less so now, which is kind of nice. But there was a definite period where every game had multiplayer Um for no reason whatsoever. And it was uh, games like Bioshock. Remember when Bioshock 2 had multiplayer? Yeah, think about that. Why? Same thing with Tomb Raider, a totally single player game that had these microtransactions uh, built into it so that the developers could get more money. The game already was produced. The company who produced it made the game, like, I just, it upsets me because that's not what games are about, especially, you know, if you are older and came from an original background in gaming where you play games in the 70s and 80s and 90s, there was no such thing as microtransactions. That's a very new thing within the last decade. Of gaming, basically. So, uh, and the nickel and diming and just the, the mentality of publishers and developers where it's like, our game has to always be online, always be uh, getting money from the players. If that's the case, your game needs to be free or I will pirate it. I will steal it because your game does not need to be $60 and then I have to pay on top of that. No, forget that. That's a bunch of baloney. So, ugh. <sighs> sorry, I didn't mean to rant there, but it's, it's, a, it's a very real issue for me with gaming where I see it all the time. This game has a full retail price model and then I'm charged on top of that for stuff that should already be in the game and I've already paid for, and you're wanting me to spend 90, 100, 400, however many dollars on little tiny content packs that don't, I guarantee you, most of that stuff doesn't take more than half a day of work for one, maybe a team of people. Tell me honestly, how many character skins and gun skins uh, how long did that take that that development team to produce? Because they're all just color swaps. And we had that back in 1991 with Mortal Kombat, you know, or 92 or 93, whatever it was. Uh, Sub-Zero and Scorpion, you know, technically two different characters, but they're actually the same character model, just color swap. How long does it take to color swap something? Not a whole lot. 
So if you're going to nickel and dime me, like I'm going to fight back on some of that stuff because you cannot lie to my face and tell me, oh, yeah, you know, our team painstakingly uh, created all these. No, you know, there's a million people online who could do the same exact job within 30 minutes and stream it and show you exactly how long it takes to color something in, especially with the tools that we have at our disposal now, as opposed to back then, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So the whole nickel and diamond thing is just is too much for me. I did have fun with Gears 5. Excuse me. But I'm not going to ever go back to it. I will never play Gears of War 5 ever again. I played it on my PC with Game Pass, which is great. I played through it. I enjoyed my time with it after that first two acts. And, you know, a third act and the fourth act, I think, are phenomenal, but they're very linear. Um, I did that and then uninstalled it, you know, because why? Why am I? I'm not going to play horde mode. I'm not going to play online with anyone. Um, and I'm not going to play deathmatch. So that game, I beat it and I'm moving on with my life. So. I'm not sure what I'm going to play next. I've been uh, kind of sitting around the house uh, most of the day today trying to figure out what I really want to play. I want to play Borderlands 3. I really do. But I'm struggling to um, justify the cost for that game. I know that it's going to be a lot of hours. And I know I'll pro- probably play with my friend Sean uh, because we... And it was one of the things that we bonded with uh, was uh, the original Borderlands playing like uh, Mad Moxie's Underground, uh, Dome, uh, Underdome, and uh, the Dr. Zed uh, zombie experience stuff. And, um, and then the second game, you know, like that's kind of our game. And I love it because it's always a really fun time. And it's, it's uh, a game that it's like a podcast game. You can just hang out and listen to other stuff while playing that. Or you can play with your friends and like Sean and I do, and we just hang out and we get to talk because he lives in a different area than I do. He lives, you know, halfway across the country. And so we can't physically hang out, you know, in the same room together, but we can play video games online and just hang out and talk and, you know, catch up and, you know, just play games together. And it's, that is what I love about multiplayer gaming. I don't like competitive gaming because it's not fun for me. It's, it's like, I, I see, it's kind of like rubber banding with video games in a way, like the old uh, NBA Jam games. Those games have um, rubber banding where one person does good, then the other person does good. And it's back and forth, just like Mario Kart as well. And so that's what I feel about competitive gaming. Maybe I'll do good one round. The other, my friend who I'm fighting against, you know, is another one. And I don't spend time with people every second of the day. So I don't want to be competitive against them. I want to enjoy their company and have fun with them, not against them. Maybe that's me and my personal nature and who I am. But I just, I, I think competitive gaming is just kind of lame. It's boring. It's like, yeah, every once in a blue moon, sure, let's do uh, a death match and I'll shoot you, you shoot me. But uh, like it, there's in Borderlands, they've got the duel system. You can be playing along and then you can shoot your friend in the head and uh, duel them. And they got to accept it and they say, all right, fine. I'm, we're going to duel out and see who shoots each other and gets the most shots or damage in. But to what point? The whole point of that is to, there's nothing on the line. It's just bragging rights, which is stupid. And then you've just wasted a ton of ammo just to shoot your friends so that you have to go help them back up or they help you up if you get down first. It's just like, why? So I want to play Borderlands 3. I just don't know if uh, he has the time. And if he doesn't have the time, I don't know if I'm going to buy it until he does. Because I want to play with my friend Sean. He's, you know, it's really fun playing with him. So that's going to do it for this podcast. Uh, I know the beginning was uh, a little rough. And, you know, like I said, it's just something I needed to get off my chest, get on uh, my mind off this subject of it sucks losing uh, an animal, a pet. Um, 
especially one so young, just a little over two years. So um, I did a little bit of uh, thinking about the outro song for this week. And uh, the intro song is just, it's Psychonauts, because that's why we named him Raz. Uh, and um, this ending, I, I was thinking maybe I'll do some uh, Cowboy Bebop or something, kind of tie the theme together. But there is an artist, a musical artist on the internet. His name is Pogo, P-O-G-O. And he, I have been uh, listening to his stuff for a long time now. Uh, probably since 2011, 2012, somewhere around there. And he does a lot of uh, cutting up of movies and, mu and mixing them with music and kind of uh, changing the tune, not auto-tune, but changing the tune and pitch of these uh, voice clips from movies and kind of syncing them to music and creating beats for them and stuff. And so he did, you know, when, when I first heard about him, he was doing a lot of Disney stuff. And I was like, oh, what is this? So he did um, a, look up Pogo Alice. That's kind of like his main first track that got traction, kind of uh, got him popular. And it's all about it's little tiny clips and repeated in a way. And it doesn't really make sense. There's no lyrics to it. It's just cut up bits uh, put to a beat of these Disney movies. And it's Alice in Wonderland for that one. And he's done a lot more since then. He's uh, taken it to the point where he does TV, oh, like uh, TV shows because he's Australian. Um, he lives in Perth. And so there's some weirder Australian and UK shows that you might not be familiar with that he's done mixes on uh, a lot of Disney stuff over the years. And I was going through uh, during the break and I was like, man, I just I, I want something kind of just different and interesting and something that kind of was maybe a little bit more melancholy you know not super happy not super sad but somewhere kind of in the middle you know that can make you feel a range of emotions if you listen to it and i was watching um i was going through pogo's list because he has a, a few songs that i really really like of that and there's one called boy and bear and this is a winnie the pooh um, track. And I think so I'm, I'm going to try and not uh, get choked up right now as I finish talking about this and end the episode. But it is about Winnie the Pooh and Christopher Robin. And it's uh, Winnie the Pooh and Christopher Robin having conversations. It's all cut up and, you know, put to beats and stuff like that. You'll hear it in a second. But I was like, man, I think, I think that uh, describes my, <laughs> my relationship with Raz. He was a friend, a true companion. As much as he was um, super energetic and bouncing off the walls half the time and super drooly and all that stuff, I really, you know, he was my first dog, so I I connect him with Winnie the Pooh. I'm not a big, or I'm not anymore, but I used to love Winnie the Pooh when I was younger. You know, The Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, that classic movie. You know, the blustery day and the rain, rain, rain came down, 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 all that. Oh, I love that stuff. So I think it's it's a good fitting end track for this kind of emotional. I, I'm sorry to be a bit downer of an episode, but a boy and a bear, you know, uh, he was my Winnie the Pooh. He was um, a companion that I loved. So I'm going to play that song right now. Thank you very much for listening. Sorry to get a little bit, again, emotional and stuff like that, but you know, losing a pet's hard. And I've never gone through that, really. Um, all my animals growing up all ran away, so I never actually witnessed them uh, dying. Um, we had a cat, Nemo, who passed away last year, and you know, he wasn't my cat. I only married into <laughs> that. So when he passed away, it was a bummer, but I wasn't even there. You know, I was working out of town. Um, so I didn't even get to see that stuff. And, and it just didn't affect me in the same way Raz did. I, I held his head as he passed. And man... <laughs> If you've never done that before, man, it is, it, it's messed up. 
you know, but it's good in a way to be able to realize that we all live and we all die. You know, every one of us is going to die, you know, if the, unless the rapture happens, but it is an emotional thing. And I thank God for the time that I had with Raz. And I just wanted to dedicate this episode to the memory of him because he was my little psychonaut. And I loved him. And I'll miss him. <laughs> Christopher Robin, what exactly is doing nothing? Well, I'm told it means going along, listening to all the things you can't hear, and not bothering. you can't hear no.